Good morning. Thankful everyone is here with us today, and we would be getting your Bibles and be ready to study with us. We're going to start off this morning with a question, and the question is, does everyone have the right to his own belief? When we start thinking about a question like this, we have to take a lot of things into consideration. First, we need to understand that man is the highest species of life in the physical world having the ability to both reason and make logical decisions. Also in relation to that question, secondly, man was created as a free moral agent, having the ability to decide between two or even more alternatives. And thirdly, we live in a nation with the legal right to pursue our own personal convictions, whether we want to worship, or not to worship, to believe in the one true living God or multiplicity of gods or even to be atheist. We have that right in this country. Our Constitution affords us that right. If we want to believe in God, we can. If we don't, we don't have to. If we want to choose multiple gods, we could do that. We can pick and choose what we want. But let's get down to the real crux of the matter. And ask that question one more time. Does every person have the right to his own belief? Now when we think about that, there are a lot of things not related even to the first three little questions that I ask that we need to consider. Because we need to understand that when we go to that question and say that and answer it, yes, I do have the right to my own belief, we have to consider some things. First of all, we have to consider the fact that man must realize there are consequences to his actions. We must all realize that when it comes to saying, I've got the right to my own belief, we also have to understand the consequences that come with those beliefs. Let me illustrate it this way. A man may pick a bottle up out of the cabinet thinking he's taking medicine, but it might have been a, a bottle of poison. And he drinks that bottle of poison thinking it's medicine. Now, in his heart, he truly believes that he's taking medicine, but he drinks poison. Are there consequences of that action? Absolutely. He could get sick or he could die. Now, I know that may be far-fetched to some people when you start thinking about a question like that, but that's what we're talking about. People in this life in making decisions think they're making good and rational decisions, and sometimes they're not. And there are times in our own lives and every single person here who has lived very long on this earth has had to make a decision that ultimately turned out to be the wrong decision. We have to understand that. And our decisions bring about or carry consequences. Anything we do in this life, there are consequences for actions. Now the consequences may be positive, or they may be negative. Religiously, mankind has the opportunity to choose between thousands of beliefs or to reject them all and be an atheist. We have that right to choose. But the one true living God wants us to worship Him. And He's not going to force us to do so. He gives us, an, as free moral agents, the opportunity to worship Him and do what is right and not live a life of sin and not do what is wrong. He gives us that choice, but He's not going to make us do that which we don't want to do. He's provided us incentives to worship Him and submit to Him. Of course, the ultimate incentive is an eternal home in heaven with Him to those who obey Him. John, as he wrote the book of Revelation in Revelation twenty two fourteen, 14, wrote this. Blessed are they that keep his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in into the gates into the city. Blessed or happy are those who will keep the commandments of God and do his will and follow the Bible because they have the right to the tree of life. They have that opportunity to the tree of life and they can enter into the gates of the city of heaven and spend eternity with him. That's what God offers us when we make the right choice. The ultimate consequences 
of rejecting the one true living God and His commandments is eternal damnation. In the second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote in chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, notice this phrase, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. There are the consequences. For those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, those who do not keep the commandments of God, it's going to be in flaming fire. He's going to come taking vengeance. So there are consequences for our actions. So if we want to answer that question, does everyone have the right to his own belief? Yes. But remember the consequences. If we keep his commandments, it's heaven. If we fail to, it's eternal damnation. So we have to decide in our own lives what we're going to do. Are we going to keep the commandments of God so we can go to heaven and be with him eternally? Or are we going to just do what we want to do and face the consequences? The Apostle Paul commended the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8-10 through 10, because they had turned from idols to serve the living God. They had been in the, in the wrong. They had been making the bad choices. And he was thankful to God that they had made a change in their life. And that's possible in anyone's life today who, who is willing to make the change. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 8-10, through 10, he says, For... From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would have spread abroad, so that we not, need not speak anything. For they themselves showed of us the manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God, and to wait for the Son of, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. He is praising the Thessalonians because he said, you were making bad choices, now you're making good choices. You turn from idols, from serving these little gods, to serving the one true living God in heaven. And you're preparing yourself for that place in heaven. Do we have the right to make the choice of what we want to do? Well, most of the time, but then there are some religions who will force others to, and make those choices for them. They will force them and make them submit to their religion. It's been said that the people of Afghanistan, that when the Taliban was defeated, many of the men shaved their beards off because they didn't want to necessarily wear them, but because they were forced into Islam, they were forced to have a beard. They shaved their beards off to show that they were no longer under that. Many of the women took their head coverings, face coverings off in public, which was a crime to show that now they had more freedom. Now that doesn't say that these people were right religiously in what they did, but they were showing we don't want to be under this anymore. It also shows they were forced to do that as part of their religion. In Iran few years ago, an Iranian man professed a belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he was arrested and was set to be executed. Because you have to realize in Iran and many other Muslim countries that it is against the law to have any other belief in anything other than Allah and the Islamic religion. And when a man professed that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he was in prison for it and threatened to be executed. Now think about that. When a religion forces you to believe that way and will not give you the freedom of choice, there's something wrong with that religion. And that's what we see not only with Islam, but there are other religions that do similar things. However, in contrast... What we read about in the Bible, the one true religion of Christianity is not forced upon anyone by the will of God. 
as free moral agents. We can accept Christianity. We can reject Christianity. We can do whatever we want. Of course, God wants all men to be saved and provides the means and opportunities necessary and even the motivation for us to submit to Him. Nevertheless, it's strictly voluntary. I remember growing up where regardless of what religion it was, whether it was right or wrong, just about everyone I knew went somewhere to a church building on Sunday. Now look out here. If you walked outside the, the building right now, within just a minute you'd see hundreds and hundreds of cars going by because they don't care about any kind of religion. They don't care about God. They don't care about the Bible. And we're not talking about just any kind of religion. We're talking about New Testament Christianity. And you're seeing even New Testament Christianity getting smaller and smaller because people are too busy to worry with God. They have so many things to do in their lives, they don't worry about worshiping God as the Bible commands us because they're too busy with life. They think. They make the choices. But remember, with the choices comes consequences. If you look back in the Old Testament, Joshua 24, Joshua, the military leader of the Israelites, encouraged them to make the right choice. And he even put it to them this way in Joshua 24, and verses 14 and 15, when he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. He puts it to them straight in that verse, doesn't he? But look at verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you do dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now notice how Joshua puts this to them. He first of all tells them that you need to serve the Lord in verse 14. And you need to do it in sincerity and in truth. But if you think it's evil to serve the Lord, now who would think it's evil to serve the Lord? Well, a lot of people nowadays would because of their lifestyle. And even back in Joshua's day. And he said, so if you think it's evil to serve God or serve the Lord, then you need to choose, make a choice who you're going to serve all of us are making choices in our lives one way or the other. We're either serving God or we're serving the devil. We're either choosing good or we're choosing evil. It can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. Matthew 6 tells us that. We cannot serve God and mammon. So we have to make that choice. And Joshua's putting it straight to the people of Israel. Make that choice now. We're going to go over to the promised land. You need to make the choice who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve these idols or are you going to turn and serve God? He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He took his stand and made his decision to do what was right. We need to do the same thing today. We find in the New Testament where Jesus Christ extends the great invitation. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He gives us that invitation to come and serve him. You notice it's not forced. You're going to do this or else. I'm going to force you to do this. No, Jesus offers an invitation. He invites people to obey Him and serve Him. Now, there are commandments that tell us to, but people still reject those because they make that decision like drinking a bottle of poison to do something that's harmful to them. Not physically like poison, but spiritually and eternally. We know that Jesus died for all humanity he died to save men's souls. We've got to make that choice to accept that invitation and obey Him. Well, let's go further. Secondly, we see that God has provided the adequate proof for His existence to show that we need to serve Him. 
We know it's true in the physical realm. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth showeth his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. We can see the things of this earth. We can see the beauty of this earth. It didn't just happen by chance through evolution. That in six days, according to the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. And we can see God everywhere in this earth, in nature. We can know there's a God just by what we see around us. So he's provided adequate proof for his existence to encourage us to serve Him. But it is through His will, His divine Word, where He tells us more and more about Him. And matter of fact, that's the only way we can truly know about what God wants us to do is through obeying His Word. He's provided proof through His inspired Word for us to follow Him. Over in Romans 1, verses 19 through 21, Paul told the Romans, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. See, verse 20 tells us that we can see that through, through the creation that there's a God. And even when people knew during Paul's time that there was a God, they refused to acknowledge Him as a God. And their foolish heart was darkened because they turned from Him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we know we have a Bible with 66 books in it, written over a period of about 14 to 1,500 years that has absolutely no contradictions whatsoever in it that gives us that hope of redemption for our souls. We simply need to open the Bible up and read and study it. Paul even told the, the letter to Timothy, he wrote Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This Bible, the Word of God, completely furnishes us in all good works. It's all we need. We don't need catechisms. We don't need disciplines. We don't need manuals. We don't need other books to put beside the Bible that tells us what a certain religion might believe or what they want to believe. All we need is a Bible to get us to heaven. And if we open it and study it and obey it, that's where we'll be one day. But we have to make that choice to do so. We have to have the desire, first of all, to go to heaven, to obey God, and then continue in being obedient to His Word and one day we'll hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. We don't want to hear, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. But those who make the other decision not to follow him, that's what they're going to hear one day. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled during the time of Christ. And they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, a large portion of them. For example, the seed of woman. Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. And that seed was not from any man. If you go back to Genesis 3.15 in the prophecy where Moses is writing, that God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The first messianic prophecy that Christ would ultimately deal a crushing blow to the head of Satan. We find in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, Now the birth of Jesus Christ is on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. And he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, 
For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save the people from their sins. Now this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Now that quote that we find in Matthew 1 came from Isaiah 7, 14. And we see that Jesus was conceived of a virgin and she brought forth a son. We know that he was called Jesus or Emmanuel, God with us. It was foretold several hundred years prior to the coming of Jesus that this would happen, Isaiah 7. And we see the fulfillment in Matthew 1. It was also foretold that Jesus would be rejected by the Jews. Isaiah in Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As we hid, it, if it were, or as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we esteemed him not. If you look in John chapter 1 verse 11, John wrote about it. And he said he came to his own, and his own received him not. Came to his own people, and many of his own family didn't believe who he was initially. So we see that he was rejected. There are more than 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah throughout the, the Bible and throughout the New Testament which Jesus fulfilled. These are only just a few that are given suffice that, to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we have a responsibility. If we want to go to heaven, then we have to submit to His will. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross for our sins. Luke 19.10 tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there's... Know the name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of Christ through obedience to his gospel. That's what God requires of us. That's what he commands of us. Do we have to do it? No, he gives us the free will to choose if we want to go to heaven or if we want to go to hell. I'm just putting it plain and simple. There's no reason to beat around the bush because that's what it is. It comes down to heaven or hell. There's no in-between there's no, well, you can squeak by because you are a halfway decent person. We're either faithful, obedient servants of Christ, fulfilling all of what God has told us in the Bible, being dedicated New Testament Christians, or we're sinners, and we're doomed. But the great thing about this is we have a choice. It's not chosen for us telling us you can't make a decision. You're either going to heaven or hell. I don't care how you live. You can live a great life, but if I don't want you here, you're not going. God made man a free moral agent, and he's given us that opportunity and the right and the privilege to choose where we want to go. And we make that choice by how we live here upon this earth. If we live like the world, we're like the world. But when we live like Christ and are like Christ, which is in the very term of the word Christian, we're like Christ. People can see that and see that we don't talk, act, or do like the people of the world do or talk or act. We set the example and we serve God faithfully so that heaven can be our home. All of mankind is obligated to submit to the one true living God. We are obligated to that. Nevertheless, Heavenly Father is not going to force anyone to do it. He's going to give you and me both that choice. All these people in this world, all these people in Spring, Texas, and Harris County, and all the surrounding counties, and all over the place that we see going about their lives every day and doing the things they want to do, and doing it without God are going to face those eternal consequences because they make the choice to do wrong rather than right. 
And that's why we need to make the choice to serve God. Just as Joshua told the people in Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you serve. We have to make that choice. But we should be like Joshua of old and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What are you going to do today? What is your choice? I know everyone is here and worshiping God faithfully. I hope your choice is because you are here, you see the importance of it. I want to go to heaven and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. Regardless if man is pleased with me or not, as long as God is pleased with me and I'm doing right, I want to go to heaven. And I'm going to choose that way and I'm going to live according to God's word to make sure that I can be in heaven. I hope that's a choice that we're all making. However, as a child of God, if it's not, maybe you're not doing what you should today in your life. Maybe you've turned away from God. Why not come back today and repent of your sins, confess them, and pray for the forgiveness of them? As one of God's children, you can make those changes, and God will forgive you if you are truly repent and turn from your sins. If you're here and you're not a Christian, the most important thing that a person will ever do in his or her life is become a Christian. And in order to become a Christian, you hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17, which says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said in John 8, 24, Except you believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. That's the end of that verse. Except you believe that I am He, the Son of God, you're going to die. So we have to have that belief. It's a must. And through that faith, we have to change our lives in repentance. Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We find in Acts chapter 8, as the Ethiopian was going on his way in a chariot, Philip joined him on that chariot and preached to him Jesus. And they came to certain water, and the eunuch stopped Philip, and he said, Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, If thou believest, thou mayest. Belief is necessary, but we have to make that confession. And we see the eunuch making that confession. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That chariot stopped and Philip took him down to the water and he baptized him. The man came up rejoicing. Why would he come up rejoicing after his baptism? Because he reached the blood of Christ and was saved. On the day of Pentecost, those people were told in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. There's an element that we have to remember. Our baptism is not because we've already been saved and we're just doing it to do it or doing it to profess an outward faith. That tells us we're baptized to have our sins washed away because it was in Jesus' death that His blood was shed, Romans 6, 3, and 4. We're baptized into that death, those same verses, and it is there we reach the blood of Christ. There's nothing miraculous in the water. It's the fact that He says, go down into the water to be baptized to reach the blood of Christ and your sins will be washed away. When you come up out of that water, you do like that eunuch did and go on your way rejoicing having been saved by Christ's precious blood. If you haven't done that, you have that opportunity today. Having done that and turned away, you also have that opportunity. We encourage you to take that right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?